I remember uh, a time when I was in high school, a, a man started coming to our church. He was a handsome man. He was, he was uh, likable. He had a beautiful wife and two children that loved him dearly. Um, he had a good job. He was the kind of person, you know, when you first meet him, you're just glad to be able to, chance to be able to have the chance to get to know him better. Well, after a few months into our church, he made an appointment to see my dad. And my dad was thinking, I wonder what this guy could be struggling with because his life seems perfect. And um, he came in and he told my dad that he felt worthless all the time. And he said that he struggled even to have the will to live. And this was shocking for my dad. And my dad listened to him, asked him questions, and he found out that he had very critical parents. He had parents who were disappointed with him, who shared that with him, repeatedly told him they were uh, frustrated with the life that he was leading and the person that he turned out to be. And uh, this was, was a heavy thing that hit this man. Incredulous, my dad told him they were wrong. He said they didn't know what they were talking about. He said, think about how much your family loves you. He said, think about how much the church respects you. He said, tell your parents to go jump in the lake. <laughs> and the man just kept looking at my dad sadly and shaking his head and just saying, they're my parents. Well, it wasn't much later that our church and our community was shocked when this man took his own life. And I'll never forget what a testimony that was of the power of words. The power of words. That's our subject this morning from the book of Proverbs. We're going to learn in our study today that our words have the power to do damage that can't be remedied. We can speak words that we can never take back, that will never be forgotten. Our words can wound like the thrusts of a sword. And this will be the inspired word of God, not uh, an angry preacher or someone who's just had a fight with his wife or anything like that. This is the word of God telling us the potential, uh, the negative, destructive potential of our words. Words have been the cause of suicide. They've been the cause of murder. Words have even led to war itself. Hundreds of thousands, millions of casualties have resulted from the destructive power of our speech. Words can be toxic psychologically. They can seep like chemicals in the ground, polluting everything. Like when a child is called stupid or a child is, is told they're ugly early in their life and they can never forget it. They're polluted by those words. This is the powerful destructive potential of our speech. And it comes out in many places. In the Proverbs, the Proverbs speak about our words for good or evil, but they speak 70 times, 70 Proverbs, references, making it the top subject talked about next to wisdom itself. It's the subject that's most often mentioned in the book. And so it hits hard today. We're going to read a lot of those Proverbs to you. I'll let you hear them, and I'll be speaking about them, putting them in different points and categories. But I want you to hear from the Word of God this morning on a very practical subject, what it says about our words, our words. Extremely powerful. And here's the first key statement. Our tongue can be a fountain or a fire. If you're taking notes, that's the first key statement. Our tongue can be a fountain or a fire. Tremendous positive, tremendous negative potential coming from the same source. Our tongue, our words, our speech can bless or curse. They can build up or they can destroy. Either way, they're very powerful. Our words can make or break our life as the speaker and also the lives of those we speak with. And usually the ones who bear the brunt of that are those we love the most, who are the most important and the most vulnerable uh, to us in our family, our friendships, our workplace. Um, and all of this has nothing to do with how eloquent we are or how much we like to talk. Our speech comes from our heart. That's what makes it powerful, not how well you put words together. And as we are in the lives of others, whatever we say is heart material, fountain, or fire. It's extremely powerful regardless of a turn of the phrase. How eloquent, how much you like, how extroverted or expressive you are doesn't make any difference. What you say, all of us, what we say can be a fountain or a fire. 
So we'll take the positive potential first. Um, and let's talk about our words being a fountain. And, and this is just an amazing to me this week. It's tremendous excitement of the potential positive potential of our speech. And this is true for ourselves, for God, and for all other people. We can speak to ourselves. We can speak to God. We can speak to others and bring life and bring all kinds of good things. Here are some of the Proverbs. You ready? Here we go. We're going to do a lot of Proverbs. Like I said, there is 70 and we won't do all of them. But here comes a lot of Proverbs. Proverbs 12, verse 25. Anxiety in the heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. A good word makes it glad. Proverbs 15, 23. How delightful is a timely word. And you'll notice in the Proverbs, there's a lot about the timing, about it being an apt word, about being in the moment. We need to trust God in the moment to say just the right word, and God will give us that. And again, it won't be the turn of the phrase. It'll be the fact that you said that in that moment to that person at that time, and it was just what they needed. And God wants to use your speech to do amazing things in the moment, in the setting of your life, in the ebb and flow of your daily experience and conversations with people. If we're sensitive, if we're aware of this potential, then we can Speak that word in its moment, in its season. Proverbs 16, verse 13. Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and he who speaks right is loved. Your speech can make you love. Your words make you love, not for their eloquence, but for their timeliness and for, and for the blessing and the life and the encouragement and the strength and the guidance and the wisdom that it brings to people around you. The most important people in the world, like kings, can delight in you. You can be loved by those around you if you recognize this potential and use it from your words, from your speech, from your lips, your tongue can make you this uh, delightful or this loved by others. Proverbs 16, 24, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bone. See, we speak from our soul, from our heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when we speak, it goes into the soul, into the heart of those around us. And it can be healing. Deep healing in your bones, deep healing. Don't you want to have that kind of effect? Don't you want to have that kind of a, a soothing, uh, a so, sa saving so, a solution, be part of the solution in the people's lives? This is our potential in our speech. Proverbs 13, verse 2, from the fruit of their lips, people enjoy good things. Proverbs 18, 20, from the fruit of their mouth, a person's stomach is filled. With the harvest of their lips, they are satisfied. Proverbs 10, 11, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, is a fountain of life. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And because of this, now we'll see Proverbs that speak of the value of the tongue since it's so powerful. Proverbs 10, 21 says, the tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. Proverbs 25, 11 says, like apples of gold and settings of silver, a word spoken in right circumstances. Like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. <laughs> that can happen for you every day. Apples of gold and settings of silver can be your words, your conversation, the way you bless those who are most important in your life. Proverbs 20, 15, there is gold and an abundance of jewels, but the lips of knowledge are a more precious thing. You getting the idea? You see how important, how powerful our speech, our words can be uh, for the good. I want you to think about that, please, just for a moment. I want you to think of the potential power of your words. You see, this is a key way we're different from animals. They don't do this. They don't communicate with words. Um, like we do, that's our great strength. That's one of the ways we're made in the image of God. And it's a very powerful thing. We have a, a fountain of life right behind our teeth. And we carry it with us wherever we go, hooked up to the spirit of God, the word of God. We're able to use that as a, a life-giving fountain to others. We want to not just stay in the Old Testament in our series on Proverbs. We, want, we recognize there's so much other revelation and the Holy Spirit and Jesus, the Gospels and the Epistles. So the great parallel for today is the book of James chapter 3, where he echoes these truths. He says in his longest section in the Bible, long, longest one single section on the tongue, he says, a huge horse is controlled by a small bit. A huge ship is controlled by a small rudder. And a whole human being is controlled by their tongue, by their speech. It sets the course for their whole life. What the person says 
makes that much difference in the consequences, in the outcome of their, their life, what it turns out to be. And I want to say this is true before we ever say a word to anyone else. Like I said, first, before that, we speak to ourselves. We speak to God. And already our tongue, our speech is a fountain of life when we speak to ourselves and to God. So here's the next key statement. We have to stop listening to ourselves and start talking to ourselves. It's a crucial statement. We have to stop listening to ourselves. I, I'm speaking very practically to you as your pastor. I know for me, and I know it's true for you, we all have random thoughts that come through our minds that we can't help. We have fears, we have doubts. We look out and we see so many strong people, successful people, attractive people, you know, and they're, they're speaking words, they're giving opinions, and we can watch and see the kind of world that that shapes for them. And, uh, but in the end, what are we saying? You see, so many people are talking, so many people, God is talking, but what are we saying? What are we saying? That's what we believe. That's what we land on. That's where we plant the flag of faith. That's where we say, hey, this word, these words will shape the course of my life. Not all these opinions, not, not all these thoughts and doubts and fears and random thoughts. No, when we start to speak, we land. What are you saying? What are you saying? I know for me, I'm going to speak God's word because I like the world he created when he spoke, not the world so many have created with their words. And I want his word to be my words and I want that to shape my world. And so I'm going to speak when I speak the words, the opinions, the thoughts of God. And that's the most powerful thing ever. And so we all start this powerful potential when we speak to ourselves, not listen to ourselves, but when we speak to Ourself. God hears, God responds, and He sets the whole course of our life. Well, we can also speak uh, to God. It's very powerful to speak to ourselves, but hey, when we speak to God, that's when we become a Christian. That's when we are saved. Isn't this the amazing thing? Romans 10, verse 10 says this shockingly, how powerful our words are for all eternity. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Do you know that millions of people have been saved from God's judgment, saved from their sin, saved from a life of misery, saved from an eternal destiny in hell, all by words they've said to God? Their life has changed. It's been transformed. It's become a light instead of darkness. And it all happened when they said certain words to God. Do you know that you could say those words today if you've never said them and you can actually become a Christian today in, the mo in this moment? I'm saying words to you. You could pick up these words now that I'm going to say in just a moment, and you could say them if you meant them from your heart. You could make God your father instead of your judge. You could go on a whole new direction of his life and his blessing instead of his judgment and his wrath all because of words like this. God, I agree with you that I have sinned and deserve your judgment. I deserve to die and be forever separated from you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me, taking the punishment for my sin. These are words that have been said by millions of people for thousands of years, and it's changed them forever. Please forgive me now. Make me one of your children. Lead me in a whole new direction in the days ahead. Take me to be with you in heaven when I die. I trust in you alone for my salvation. Words like these, you could say them and they have the power of life. Your tongue can be a fountain of life to you as you speak to yourself and say, I believe this, I say these words, but also as you speak to God and you say this prayer, it's the sinner's prayer basically, there's many variations of it, but you say words like that, and many of us have said those, and that's how our lives have changed. We have testimonies, we have stories that went back to that, that uh, confession, that powerful declaring of a prayer to God. You see, we pass from death to life because here's the next key statement. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. We go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We join the family of God. God comes and lives in us through his Holy Spirit. 
and he gives us a whole new identity and power and all of that goes back to words. We say, Isn't it amazing the potential of our words when we say them to God? And then we go on and he says, and I'll keep giving you so many things from heaven when you keep talking to me, keep saying words. It's called prayer and God sets up so much of his blessing and he says, you got to talk to me. You got to say words. You got to speak prayers and I'll answer them. And that's how you'll get the rest of my blessing. Keep talking to me. Keep saying words like you did when you were saved and I will answer your prayers and enrich you with so many blessings from heaven. Again, the power of our words, not, not to others yet at all, just to ourselves and to God. And then finally, we begin to speak to others. And when we do, we can tell them how we were forgiven of our sin. And, and when they hear that, they can say those same words and they too can have that forgiveness of sin and that eternity with God in heaven and God as their father and being adopted into the family of God. All that can happen for them simply because we told them our story, our testimony, how it was real for us. And they believed it and they said those same words and they too were saved See the powerful effect we can have with our words to other people. We can also encourage other people. We can pray. It's a simple thing. You know, the people in your life, you just say, God, show me their qualities. I can see the negatives. I don't need your help, but let me see the positives. And when we see a positive, ask for God to give you believable words to describe those positives to them so that they will believe it and have courage in their hearts to reach their full potential. It's called encouragement. Put courage in people's hearts. Be a mirror that reflects them an image they like of themselves that fills their heart with strength. And sometimes for the first time, people will hear from you things they never even knew were true of themselves. They can't see themselves till you say it to them and you believe it and you speak it to them and then they'll live up to that potential. That's the power of our words to encourage. Ask God to show you those qualities, give you believable words to say for them to hear. Give them courage to reach their full potential. Very important. Powerful fountain of life as you begin to speak to other people. This is what we need. You know, a comforting word can prevent suicide. Do you know a diplomatic word can prevent war? You know, a gentle word can save a marriage from anger getting out of control and destroying it beyond repair. You know, a visionary word can lead to a successful career for ourselves or others. If we just see and have a vision for someone, put a dream in their mind, it can lead to a lifelong career that enriches them and blesses them for the rest of their life. All comes back to the potential of our words. Like apples of gold and settings of silver, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones, truly a fountain of life. I want you to expect that every day through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you can be a fountain of life, that your words would bless people like that. People you love the most, who are the most vulnerable to you, who are the most important people in your life, you can bless them with the power of your speech. You know, we tend to minimize the power of our words when we say things like, well, you know, that person's all talk and no action or talk is cheap. What we don't realize is that any good thing we ever do in our life is preceded by talk. I was thinking about soldiers going into battle. They never go into battle until they are directed and challenged by their commanding officer and until they speak to their own hearts and find the courage to do such a thing. Powerful words lead to powerful actions. Don't minimize the power of words. And so many of our actions, so many of the genuine things that we actually do in our life that are so important uh, in include our speech or happen when we talk. Again, like getting saved, becoming a Christian, praying, sharing the gospel, building strong relationships. When we work on our marriage, we work on our family, work on our friendships, work on our working co uh, colleague relationships. We're speaking. So much of that is speaking. The power of speech is involved in our life's work, offering wisdom and encouragement to others. So much of this that's so important is happening in our talk and don't minimize talk. Talk is extremely powerful. It comes from our hearts. It lands in the hearts of other people and it leads to amazing things, amazing potential. The, the, before we go on to the more negative challenging point that our tongue can be a fire, I want to pause and have communion. I don't want you to think the sermon's ever. You're not getting off that easy. Uh, but right here in the middle, I'd like to lead you in communion. Um, do you ever wonder what the most powerful words are that you can possibly say? <laughs> I was thinking about that this week. <laughs> the most powerful words we could possibly speak is when we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back. 
It's when we say, Jesus Christ died for me. Jesus died on the cross for my, oh my gosh, I'm getting goosebumps. Just saying those words, you're talking about the power of speech. Now you're landing on the most powerful word you could possibly say, Jesus Christ died for me. And I know when we take communion, we, we're told to be effective in communion. It's supposed to be a proclamation of the Lord's death until he comes. This is 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Somehow when we take communion, we're to speak and to speak the most powerful words, po words possible. And that is that Jesus died and he died for us. I know for me, uh, about a little over a month ago at the Good Friday service, I got so moved by how wonderful the cross is that I, I, I purchased a gold cross and I love wearing it ever since. I've been putting it on every day. I take it off at night, so I'm putting it on a lot. And when I put it on, uh, I say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the love and the grace and the strength and the blessing you showed when you died for me on the cross. And then I, and then I just touch it and I hold it. I know it's close to my heart. And I, I have a sense that that's very powerful when I say that, when I speak that. Now I'm landing. Now I'm believing uh, uh, amidst all the words and all the distractions, all the advice and all the things that are so important for our good life. Now I'm finally looking at Jesus on the cross where I can be healed, where I can be forgiven, where I can be given power and glory. Now, this is the most powerful thing you could possibly say. And that's what we do when we take communion. Some people say this is the body of Christ. This is the blood of Christ. It doesn't matter exactly what you say, but you should say something. When you take communion, whether you say it out loud, very loudly or not, or quietly to yourself in your own heart, say words, say words. You see, you're proclaiming the Lord's death every time you take communion. Say, say words. Um, Jesus, I remember today, I remember through this communion that you died for me on the cross. We have our elements here. And as we consider them, the bread, the body, of Jesus hanging on the cross. The cup, the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. It is the Lord's death. We proclaim it every time we take communion. And why stop with communion? We could do it every day. Why wouldn't you want to say the most powerful words all the time? Jesus Christ, you died. You died for me. You died to forgive me of my sins. That's not just the gospel. That's the sweet spot of the gospel. That's the tip of the spear. The most powerful words. And we say it when we take communion. So I lead you now. You can take a, a piece of the bread, whatever you have at home to remember this. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this as often as you eat it to remember me. It's so wonderful to be connected, Lord Jesus, with all these folks around town, around this area, around the world, who believe and who are remembering and declaring and proclaiming your death. And we love you so much. We thank you so much. And Jesus, when he took, when they had finished dinner, he took the cup, he said, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Mm. Oh, what a wonderful proclamation. It's the most powerful thing we could ever say. Well, now I get to put on the prophet hat a little bit. And please know I'm speaking to myself as much as anyone else. And I'm not thinking about anybody in particular. Please don't think that I'm thinking of you on any of these specifics. I'm thinking only of me. I'm thinking that this is God's word about the potential destruction of our speech. And I'm thinking of that for myself because that's the potential, the dangerous potential. And I want you to do the same thing. Don't you think about anybody else. Even though you know you can think of somebody on some of these things, don't think about yourself. Take it as a warning. This is all of our destructive potential. And so we also see that not only is the tongue a fountain, but the tongue is a fire. It is a fire. It is a fire. As children, many of us were taught to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. And nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing can have been more wrong that we, that we learned as children. 
We should rather say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can destroy my soul. Anything done to us in the physical way is nothing. It pales in comparison to what's done in us when words are spoken. Words out of control, words from an angry heart, a frustrated heart, an evil heart can destroy our soul. I remember words, mean words. I can still remember where I was when I heard them that still leave a mark, that still bring pain to me, that were said to me when I was a little boy. I can remember words I said to people I loved. I wished I'd never said that I still regret. They're very powerful. Here are the Proverbs on this. Proverbs 15, verse 4. Perversion in the tongue is the crushing of the spirit. You want to shrivel the soul? of someone you love, then you just let your tongue, your speech be perverted, be evil. Just let it flow freely when you're at your worst and you will crush the spirit of those you love to whom you are most powerful. Proverbs 10 verse 14, ruin is at hand with the mouth of the foolish. Ruin is at hand. Proverbs 12, 18, there is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword. And we're like, oh, I don't know how to get some things off my chest. I'm sorry. For what? Did you realize what you were doing? You were thrusting a sword. How is sorry going to fix that? Proverbs 16, 27, a worthless man's words are as a scorching fire. Oh, what can he do? What can he say? Everybody knows he's a fool. Oh my gosh, he just burned and scorched. Look at the blisters. Oh, look at the devastation he can still cause because it matters. It's still so powerful. So you can't dismiss it completely. Even if they're a fool, a worthless person, they can still scorch with their words. Even for the one who's speaking, there is a potential destructive force. And sometimes this might be comforting if you're thinking you're so hurt or upset at somebody that's just destroyed you with their words. But listen, they're destroying themselves. Listen to these Proverbs, Proverbs 10, 31. The perverted tongue will be cut out. This is the word of God. Proverbs 14, 3 says, in the mouth of a fool is a rod for his back. You can just count on that. He's a fool, and the wagging tongue is going to end up being a rod for his back. He'll be punished by it. Proverbs 18, 6 to 7. A fool's lips bring strife, and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his ruin. Is his ruin. Our speech can ruin our life, not just the life of, of others we're angry with, frustrated with. We ruin our own life. We tear down our own house. We tear down our own reputation with our, our words, our mouth, our speech. Again, James is the key parallel here from the New Testament. We want to fast forward to the Holy Spirit and the explanation of the gospel and Jesus and, and, and the apostles. You come to James 3, it says, and he could not express. This is one of the strongest verses in the entire Bible, James 3, verse 6. And we'll also put in verse 8. I can't think of any way to put it stronger. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. And then you add verse 8, the tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So we should think of our, of our teeth as a cage for our tongue and... Our tongue is like a poisonous snake in this metaphor, according to James, it's deadly potential. And so every time we open our mouth, we're opening the cage for our tongue to get out. And if you think of it that way, when you're not in the spirit, when you're grouchy, when you're tired, but yet you're around the people that are the most important, people like your family, but you're not in a good space, you're, you're not doing well, keep your mouth shut. Don't let the snake out to bite. Don't let the fire scorch. Surely the tongue bites sharper than the teeth and the poison is extremely deadly and damaging. And here's the key statement. Where the most damage can take place, we are the least careful. Where the most damage can take place, we are the least careful. Do you ever, you ever wonder why are we so polite and nice and restrained with total strangers, but we go home and we just vent to our family. 
and maybe we feel better, but what just happened? And how much more important are our family to us than total strangers or people who are acquaintances that we are concerned about our reputation or something? These things should not be. God gives more grace. We all stumble in many ways. I remember standing next to a, a policeman in line at Chick-fil-A restaurant and I, he was in full uniform and, and getting lunch and, and I was standing right behind him. I was the next person that wasn't social distancing. So I was right up on him and I was looking down. I was fascinated with his gun. It was like right there. I could grab it. I didn't, I promise you, but it was strapped down on his right hip. And I looked and I thought, well, I know that's on safety and I'm sure he's had a lot of training, but my goodness, everywhere he goes, he's carrying a loaded gun. He's carrying deadly force. That's got to add an extra seriousness to everything he's doing when he's on duty. I'm sure. And I want to tell you, God would say to you and me, everywhere we go, we have the equivalent of a loaded gun with us. We're sitting we're playing a game at home with our family. We're sitting at a table. We're riding in the van to, to sporting events, coming to church, whatever we're doing. There's always a loaded gun sitting right there. There's always deadly force potential. And so we've got to have the safety on. We've got to strap it down. We have to have that underlying awareness of the, how much damage we could do to those we love the most. Be aware of that. Be warned about that and guard your mouth. Guard your lips. Don't say it. Hold it in. Don't say the words. If you're not in the spirit, if you're not convinced and it's a difficult subject, just wait. Don't speak because it's got deadly force potential. I'll never forget a time when my daughter Joy, my oldest daughter Joy was in junior high and she was, she had just won a volleyball game and it was a home game and we came out in the parking lot you know, of our school and, and there was a, a girl from the away team standing with her dad and they were having a very intense conversation. The, the girl was crying, the dad was speaking harshly and loudly to her and uh, he didn't realize it but half the parking lot could hear every word he was saying. And he was treating her like she had just committed some great sin. And as I passed by, it made me physically sick because I have just enough of that in me from my own kids and from, you know, trying to do sports with them, you know, and, and then you get frustrated and you get disappointed with them. And a game that doesn't even matter all of a sudden becomes an occasion for the tongue to do its dirty work. And when I heard him just letting it go, I just, I just thought to myself, this is hell. This is hell itself. These man's words are coming straight from, from hell. And this poor girl will never forget. Somebody so powerful to her was straight from his heart where there should be blessing, where there should be encouragement, where there should be promise, belief, and faith in her potential. And instead he's giving her, and I, I didn't, Judge, I, I'm taking it on myself. That's why I got sick, because I can do that. How in the world did a stupid game ever become an occasion for that kind of speech between me and my own children? They won't say this. Your children won't say this, but they long for your blessing. They long for your affirmation. They long to know where, how they're doing. Can you give me any idea? Is there anything good? Am I a good daughter or son or bad? What? You, know, you don't say it. And they'll live up to whatever we say. You speak fire, they'll, they'll live up. You speak a fountain, they'll live up. It's very powerful. Often we won't say things outright, but we'll include barbs in our humor. Often we'll lace our speech with sarcasm, our teasing laced with criticism. You just can't do it. Just don't do it. A crucial sin of the tongue that's focused on in the Proverbs, and uh, this is way too convicting, so we'll go to another sin that maybe isn't your sin, is the sin of gossip or slander. And this one hits a church hard, so let me put on my church hat here as we wind the sermon down and just say, 
Uh, this can be extremely destructive if we're not aware of it and watching for it, the sin of gossip. Proverbs 18 verse 8 says, The words of a whisper are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. This is easy conversation. It's delicious conversation. I know for me, young people, when they're developing socially, sometimes this is the only way they can even relate to one another is to speak gossip about their peers. And uh, it's an easy thing to do. Proverbs 16, 28, a whisperer separates close friends. It, it, it leads to disunity in a church or a family or friendships. Uh, Proverbs 10, 18, whoever utters slander is a fool. And so the key remedy for this destructive sin of the tongue is to not associate with a gossip, not be a carrier. It takes two. Don't pass it along. Don't listen to it. Proverbs 20 verse 19 said, therefore, do not associate with a gossip. Proverbs 17 verse 4, wrongdoers eagerly listen to gossip. Liars pay close attention to slander. Now, what is gossip? Listen, gossip is speaking negatively about someone who's not in the room. Somebody's not here and we're having a conversation about them and we're not saying nice things. We're not saying positive things. That should immediately be a red flag. Some people say, well, it's not gossip if it's true. It's not really God. No, definitely. It's still gossip. If you say negative things, even if they're true about somebody and they're not around to defend themselves. And if you're saying it in such a way that it takes their reputation down in the mind in the, of the hearer, that is uh, gossip. Don't pass it along. Don't be a care, a carrier. In fact, make a positive statement about the person being slandered, and hopefully the slanderer will get the hint, and, uh, and they'll move on and stop talking with you about it. A church like ours that's strong in community can become a breeding ground for gossip. Here's two ways. One is you're sharing a prayer request, and you're like, let's pray for Jane and John Doe. Let's pray for Pete Bunny. Oh, really? What's going on with, with them? Oh, well, you know. I mean, there's a lot of struggle, a lot of difficult things. Oh, really? Could you give me any more detail? And boom, we're talking and we're gossiping. Another one is you're hurt. You've been hurt by someone and you, you want to go somewhere with that pain. And so you go and, and you want counsel from someone. And, and, and it's an easy time when you're hurt to reach out to people who won't be confidential or to reach out to people who aren't stronger than you won't make you take that where it needs to go. And then before you know it, you're spreading negative things about the folks who've hurt you. And you're adding a wrong thing uh, in the time of your pain. You're doing something wrong instead of doing something right. Always take, seek counsel from someone who is stronger than you, who will help you do the right thing with that information. Um, instead of just commiserating with a friend or someone, make sure it's confidential. Uh, here's the key statement for gossip. Someone who gossips cannot be trusted, cannot be trusted. You're sitting in a room, somebody starts talking negative about somebody who's not there. You can think to yourself, wow, if you'll say bad things about them when they aren't here, what's going to keep you from saying bad things about me when I'm not here? And the answer is nothing. Don't share anything with that person. Don't trust that person because they'll just as easily gossip about you when you're not present. You can't trust someone who gossips. Here's two key mottos as we close. The first is the absent are safe here. It'd be a nice motto in your office or in your home, be a conversation piece just says the absent are safe here. When it comes to negative information or reducing reputations, the absent are safe here. The other is always to or never about always to never about always to. We're not going to just talk about it. We're going to take this information where it needs to go. And let's just let's be part of the solution, but not just talk about it. And those are some key things when it comes to sin of gossip. Well, with all of that, the key thing is to control our tongue. Uh, Proverbs 19 or Proverbs 10, 19 says, where there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. Proverbs 10, 8, a babbling fool will be cast down. Proverbs 13, 3, open wide your lips, you come to ruin. And then a man of understanding keeps silent, Proverbs 11, 12, Proverbs 13, 3, guard your mouth and preserve your life. And then finally, uh, Proverbs 21, 23, guard your mouth and your tongue and you guard your soul from troubles. So we keep our mouths shut. We, we, we guard our lips, but at the same time, we know it's a fountain and we've got to speak. We've got to speak to bless people. So may God give us 
the wisdom to know when to speak and when to be quiet. Why don't we pray now? Would you pray with me and let's ask for God's help. Father, we know that we all stumble in many ways. We know that you give more grace. We know that you can help us in this powerful responsibility that you did not give the animals, but that you gave us since we're made in your image to speak, to speak life or death, to speak a fountain or a fire. And so save us, Lord, from the negative potential, the fire, the poison, the ruin, the destruction. Uh, give us your power, your spirit's power to tame our tongue and be quiet when we should and speak when we should. Oh, Lord, save us from angry words, critical words, and, and from gossip. Make our words apples of gold and settings of silver. May they be a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. We pray in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.